and welcome back everyone. I hope you had a really great day yesterday. It's great to see all the conversations going on in the chat and we had some great conversations in the networking event at the end of the day yesterday. I'd like to call out some of the upcoming talks for today but I just couldn't pick out just a few. There were just so many that looked interesting. I'm really glad that we're going to be able to make all this content available on YouTube after the event. But to hint at the diversity of our lineup, we got talks about API design, talks about API discovery, SDKs, and API contracts. We have GraphQL, gRPC, and even Rust making an appearance. Pay attention to the schedule as we have two more open discussions that have been added to the agenda. One on contract testing later in the day and one on leveling up ability to design and document APIs with OpenAPI right after the keynote break. But before we get the session started, we have our keynote panel. This is such an important topic because technology for technology's sake is just a waste of time for all of us. It's important to continually remind ourselves of the value that we are bringing to our companies and to our customers. We have an awesome panel of people who'll be sharing their knowledge and experience. And I think we're gonna have some really interesting conversations. So make sure you take advantage of the chat. The side conversations can really add to the value and we'll have some time for questions afterwards. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to our moderator, Eric, to get started. And everybody's hunting for the video and the mic button to turn on. Any minute now, they will be joining us on stage. Ah, we have one, we have two. Hey Gail, hey Ina. Now we just need our moderator. Oh, there's Eric. Hey, now we just need audio. We got video now. Okay. Okay, Eric. Can you Welcome. hear me? <laughs> I'll hand it over to you now, Eric. Thank, thank to you, Daryl. Yeah, that was that was good suspense. You know, will they appear? Who's appearing first? Who shows up? Can they talk? Uh, yeah. So. Hello, everybody, and um, welcome to this keynote panel. My name is Erik Wilde, and I'd like to first like to thank the ASC conference organizers and specifically Darren Miller and Taylor Burnett for making this panel possible. So when I submitted my proposal for my proposal was titled, what is, what is the specification of an API product? They said, that's an interesting question. It's so interesting, we actually would like to invite some people. And that's what happened. So we turned this into a keynote panel. Then they invited a really, really good set of people to discuss with. I think we'll have really interesting discussions. So I would like to make a little round of introductions. I, I, th I think I'll just go by the order of people on my screen. In that case, it's kind of randomized for me. So our first panelist is Ina Arenas from uh, Microsoft. So hi, Ina, thanks for joining. Uh, just give us a little introduction, what you're doing with APIs, what your main, I would say pain points are, you know, what, you, what you're looking for in APIs where you see that maybe there's potential for how APIs could be used better. Awesome. Thank you, Eric. And thank you everyone for joining us today. So my name is Ina Arenas. I work for Microsoft. I've been at Microsoft for the last 10 years and I lead a team who is all about APIs and we're obsessed about APIs and developer experiences. So my team is called the Microsoft 365 ecosystem and the Microsoft Graph team. And for the last, I will say, seven or so years, we have been working on um, bringing together a series, like probably 50 or more different teams and groups within Microsoft that have services in the cloud that are exposing their data. So how do we get all of these teams coordinated into how to design APIs, how to expose those APIs, how to create the best developer experiences, and how to create the best experiences for our customers? So that's all about 
uh, what my team does. And in this journey, we've been, you know, we develop API reference, we do document libraries, samples, doc, you know, all of the developer portals, and we do uh, have API architecture review forums where we help all of these different teams design their APIs. We use, um, you know, API references and specifications extensively. We are always trying to keep a pulse on what's going on in the industry to bring all of that into our practice. So mm -hmm. that's, that's my intro. Thank you for having me today in the panel. Thanks, Ina. That really sounds like a really good background. I'm looking forward to hear your opinions on the things we'll be discussing. Next one up on my screen is Mike Amundsen uh, with Amundsen.com. So, hey, Mike, it's it's great to see you again. <laughs> yeah, it's good, to, it's good to see you. Yeah. So, um, pretty often. So, yeah. There's a little intro about yourself. Yeah. So, I, um, I sp used to spend most of my time traveling. Now, I spend most of my time uh, <laughs> visiting uh, virtually with people. Uh, I focus on API design and architecture. So the, the pain points that I'm dealing with right now are um, designing for lots of different styles, whether it's gRPC or GraphQL or, or uh, Open API or Async API, and then also discovering uh, at runtime, how to better discover, connect, and integrate those APIs uh, at runtime. So those are the two pain points, sort of the general design or abstract design and uh, discovery. So, and that affects a lot the notion of how you can productize uh, APIs in some kind of API ecosystem. So that's my focus. Okay, thanks a lot. So I think you also you have a lot of um, experience to share. So I'm looking forward to that. Next one up on my screen is Gail Frederick with uh, Salesforce. So give us a little intro about yourself, Gail. And hey, good to meet you. Nice to meet you. Thanks for having me here. My name is Gail Frederick and coming to you from Portland, Oregon. Like I have a wildfire 20 miles away that I, we hope holds. Um, I'm SVP of Salesforce DX at Salesforce. And so my job is um, the developer experience on the Salesforce platform. So that includes um, Heroku, our, the Salesforce CLI, our VS code extensions for integrating with Salesforce, uh, Cold Builder, our web IDE, and a ton of APIs that drive those. So happy to be here. I'm pretty new at Salesforce, but uh, bringing the love for uh, Open API, and I'm an alumni board member of OAI. That's great. Thanks. Thanks, uh, Gail. So, oh, my screen just reordered, but that's that doesn't matter because we have only we have only one guy left. So, Adam Duvander. So, hey, uh, it's good good to see yeah. you. So, yeah. uh, every uh, Adam is with every developer. So, give us a little intro about yourself, Adam. Yeah, it's good to see everyone's faces. I'm I'm in Portland, also, Gail. So, hi from across town, or maybe down the street. I'm not sure. Hi from southeast. Uh, all right, <laughs> <laughs> northeast here. Uh, I, I put on an old API strat shirt for today and even found a lanyard. Uh, wow. Yeah, and Eric, you've got, you've got the new shirt. Uh, so I wanted to really feel as much like we're, uh, we're all at the event together as, uh, as we have been in the past. Uh, at every developer, I work with API companies to create content that developers actually want to read. And uh, I have been at a number of API companies in the past and some of you may have bumped into really ancient writing uh, on uh, in your API searches. I was the first editor of Programmable Web. Okay, I hope you're still with us. You're kind of a little shaky on my screen, but oh, that's too bad. <laughs> no, but actually, the wildfires. Okay, uh, let's hope it's not that. Okay, great. So uh, thanks everybody for the introductions. And as we've heard, right, everybody is kind of working with APIs, but with a little di different background and focus, I would say. And what I would like to do is start with a pretty, I would say, fundamental question. So one of the things that the conference is about is specifications, right? That's the name of the conference. At Open API, of course, it's kind of in everybody's mind. It's by far probably the most prominent specification in that space. And it's really useful and a lot of people use it. There's a lot of tooling around it, but it's, it's very, very technical. And that's fine. That's the focus of it. But 
the idea I had when I submitted my proposal was to say it's actually more and more what we see is that the main value of APIs is not so much in the technical aspect itself, but in what it allows to happen, that people can connect things and so forth. So then the question is, what else could we get maybe as specifications or as descriptions, this kind of thing that would help to build better ecosystem, to improve what Mike said, to improve maybe designs that are a little bit independent from specific formats, to improve discovery, all these kind of things. And before I'm, I'm doing a first round of opinion where people, I hope, have some opinions on where, maybe where the description ecosystem is lacking a little bit, I would like to do one pitch um, for a space where this could actually matter. So in the last IETF meeting, the IETF decided that there now will be a dedicated working group basically for HTTP APIs. So it used to be the case that the HTTP working group within IETF was the one that was doing all the HTTP related specifications, which meant understandably that they focused a lot on core HTTP and that it was kind of hard to get specifications into that group that were dealing with, let's say one level above core HTTP. So additional features you might want to have formats for standards for and so forth. So, so that'll change. So we will have a dedicated HTTP API working group, which looks at these a little bit higher level issues very soon. And my hope is that this group will also be a place where maybe we can start some of these activities where we come up with standards that allow us to describe things in a better way. And that will allow us to improve understanding, to maybe build better tooling, to build this tooling on standards and so forth. So that was my long introduction. So let's do a first round. I would like to hear everybody thinking what you think about, um, is there a, a specific opening for a description format where you think it would be nice if we had something for that and it's not there right now. I'll go. Anyway. Um, yes. I, uh, I have an opinion with a capital O and that is that um, I'd like to see us start looking at portfolios of APIs, you know, in, in um, at Salesforce and I was previously at eBay running the API program there. We have scrum teams who deliver a single API or one or two APIs. And to me, the big challenge that we have is inconsistencies across the portfolio in how the API is designed. And that is what causes developers the most pain and confusion. And so I don't have a specific proposal for how to add that into uh, OAS right now, but I think that that is where I am spending a lot of my time as a technical leader is looking, I mean, Salesforce has this enormous portfolio of APIs. Some are described with open APIs, some are described with uh, RAML, some are not described and trying to drive that consistency and being able to uncover where the modeling is a little bit different for the same, you know, logical construct. That's where I think the next place that we should go. So Gail, I'm, I'm just going to jump in and ask you this. Do you think this is mostly a, an asset management problem or is it mostly a design con, a governance problem? Where do you think the, the, the focus can I think start? it's a design governance and governance is a word I, I am not such a fan of. I mean, we want to enable teams delivering APIs to go quickly, but we also need to talk about the value of consistency. And when you get absolute consistency, magical things happen for, for developers. And um, so I don't think it's so much about asset management or where is the schema. It is, I have 105 APIs. I want to make sure that, you know, in, in Salesforce speak, a contact is a contact is a contact with the same data model across all of them. I want to make sure that auth is consistent across all of them so that developers can, you know, the, the cost in time to integrate a new capability is lower. So ideally you'd like to see something where maybe you could even kind of reference certain things and say in this API, this is solved in the same way it is solved in all the APIs, right? Yeah, so and you know, 
uh, the a spec 3.0 has a lot of that, right? That I would really appreciate those ads in 3.0. And of course, Salesforce has a product called MuleSoft that is <laughs> one of its capabilities is a directory of APIs. But even internally to you know your company, developers just want to you know they don't want to write the uh, scaffolding. And if they have to write the scaffolding, they only want to write it once. And so when we make uh, developers add logic into their scaffolding because we can't deal with our own quirks and iron them out before releasing the API. That's our failure. Yeah, I'm going to second what Gail was saying there. I think there is a, a people problem and a technical adoption problem when it comes to API specifications. You know, the learning curve, uh, it's quite expensive and having different teams adopt the same mechanisms consistently it is a challenge and we spend on my team a lot of energy just trying to drive consistency across our APIs and things that like seem like very trivial, right? Like naming and uh, thing like those are not necessarily things that come up uh, in, this, in the specification, but like do have a big impact when it comes to developer experiences and clarity on and cohesiveness on the API. The way that um, I think that API specifications help a lot, at least on our end, is that we use them as force multipliers, right? In my team, you know, there is no way that we could manage the scale if we didn't have a consistent use of API specifications. And we use them heavily. We rely heavily on open API. We rely heavily on our data. And, um, but there is not, they, they're not magic bullets. They are not giving us everything that we need. And, helping teams who are working on APIs, whose day job is not necessarily the API, is developing a product and driving that mindset and that culture that they have to think about their programmability as well and first. So the whole thing of API as a product is, um, it's tremendous. It takes a lot of energy and it's more culture and it's more like driving down the people and why is it important for our customers? So it does take a lot of energy. And, and I don't think that there is, a, uh, magic bullet that we have with SBI, API specifications today. Yeah, and I think one of the other things that comes up with a lot of the cases that I get involved with is it's one thing to manage uh, one part of the ecosystem, like the Salesforce part or the Microsoft part or the Google part. But I will often encounter cases where I need to use some, some Salesforce, some Microsoft, and some Google to solve my problem, right? So it isn't just uh, managing consistency within a particular zone or, you know, sub ecosystem, it starts to get to be a bigger, bigger problem overall. I definitely feel the pain of having to constantly sort of customize every step along the way. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not sure if specifications are always going to be the answer to that. Uh, a lot of times what I might need is I might need an SDK or some other scaffolding like you had mentioned that sort of papers over changes like that. But there's definitely a lot of pain there but within a within a governing body or within an ecosystem. You can definitely manage that, but that's also going to stretch out beyond that as well, right? I and I think that comes down to helping developers be able to perform the use cases that they want to, uh, or that is envisioned with either a single API or, as you mentioned, Mike, multiple APIs. And, and that is still a piece that I definitely don't see in, in open API. I think there are bits of that in uh, maybe Postman collections, but uh, being able to describe not just the endpoints, like Eric mentioned at the top, getting beyond the just the technical bits of what is possible to the actual how someone would use it and why someone would use it. And I I believe that uh, even though I'm a content guy that would often turn that into say tutorials, I believe there is a way to, to codify that into some kind of description. You know, it's interesting what Mike said, maybe we can use an SDK and I think there could be a whole other session. I should have submitted this one. What is the role of the SDK now that we have specification documents? Because I think there, you know, at, at eBay at my last job, I, we did away with our SDKs because we fell in love with open API and the idea that you could co-gen in 40 languages. But then we discovered that 
There are some situations where we want to help developers do really expert things or move fast with the APIs. And so the SDKs that we wanted to ship there were about productivity, making lots of bulk calls really simple for the developer, for example, when they're shipping a large amount of data. So remind me, please, next year to submit that session. It probably should be a panel because I think it would be really fun to get hear everyone's opinion about uh, where do SDKs live now. Yeah, I think, I think that's a really good point. One of the reasons I sort of couched it this way is I know there are a couple of people working on some pretty interesting projects in this space. Um, uh, Zenetic Nemec uh, with, uh, with Good API has this notion that he wants to build a kind of a generic uh, API connector, uh, something on, on top of HTTP or whatever that consumes APIs that are described in a way that even if somebody changes a URL or changes whether the argument goes in the, in the query line or the body, nothing breaks and the thing keeps going. In other words, there's enough metadata described in the exchange at runtime that even minor changes are, are, don't have to be recoded, right? So he talks about the idea of getting humans out of the loop and that's sort of the SDK story, right? One of the challenges of SDKs is you kind of freeze what's going on. Um, that's fine if you, everybody's freezing the same way, but if you make, if you make lots of changes, it, it gets kind of uh, crazy. And this is also uh, uh, Z, we call him, sorry. This is Z's idea of, of solving in code rather than solving uh, in just description. But he also has this idea of uh, sort of an extra description language. And he's using something that I've kind of, I and Leonard Richardson and a couple others have talked about, which is sort of a, a semantic description, a sort of a, we want to do these actions with these things, but that's a whole nother sort of level to the thing that, that I don't think is, is real common right now. So, I mean, I'm curious, certainly uh, at Microsoft, just to skip that sort of crossing streams, you must have thousands of APIs that you have to deal with, right? And you, is the normalization right now just grunt work? It's just people? Or do you have some kind of sort of meta or some other sort of layer of things that sort of cross between APIs in some kind of descriptive way? Yeah, Mike, we, we definitely have that uh, meta layer. Uh, we rely huh. heavily on OData to describe our data model um, using CSDL. We've done a lot of work on that ontology and uh, rationalization across all of the different entities that describe our products. And uh, we use it heavily to do stitching across our services. So, you know, Microsoft Graph, which is the gateway for all of our data, it's actually real time stitching of CSDL documents of over 50 plus different services uh, with like maybe more than 10,000 APIs. So like, uh, and then we all do it heavily relying on that metadata description. And it has all the pros and cons because now there's a ton of information that needs to go in and when it's not in, then a whole bunch of things in our uh, downstream dependencies because we use that metadata to generate our API reference, to generate our tooling documentation, you know, on our API playground to generate a whole bunch of different experiences around permissions and how to complete. And the lack of that metadata and that full description obviously breaks down all of that pipeline. So. We, we do rely heavily on it, but we also have challenges around how do we encourage our teams to provide the, all of the information that is needed for those reach experiences to be able to light up. Yeah. And then, I mean, in that case, you're kind of relying on the fact that, as Mike said a little bit, right, you're Microsoft, so at least everybody's interests is aligned and like there is a common standard how this, well, not fully aligned, but you know, at least, <laughs> at least theoretically aligned. And there, there is a common, at least there's a common approach, right? I think it, it becomes much harder when you look at the scenarios that Mike was mentioning where it's not even different organizations, right? It's totally yeah. different API spaces that you deal with. Yeah, it has taken us a lot of energy to get to a common approach because we have products that have evolved individually. We had uh, products that were using SOAP-based API, all of those that only have PowerShell commandlets, other ones that had like some REST APIs, but not were not, were not following the same convention as others, others that were just like WSDL, like, I mean, like, they were all over the place. And like, just like, going through all of these teams and telling them like, you know, there is this, all of this energy that you have to put on like working on your APIs and standardizing on a model, that is not trivial, right? Like that goes against resources that they could be putting on and moving forward their experiences for like end customers and end users. And in particular for my service, like we're not 
you know, if you think about developer ecosystems, there is this like the technology, pure path services, right? Like things like Azure, AWS, or the Google Cloud. And then like there is the, you know, ecosystem of, of like a platform on top of SaaS services like Microsoft 365 or Salesforce. And, you know, our, our role not, is not necessarily the primary is not uh, for our developer customers, it's more for like the end users and the product that is being built. So going to all of these different teams and telling them like, hey, you have to spend all of these energy to like modernize your SOAP API that hasn't seen any love in 30 years, that's a hard sell. And so it's it's been it's been taken as a tremendous amount of energy to to get to where we are and getting to that level of agreement on what are like you know adopting auth 2.0, all of us doing HTTP based APIs and uh, using like OData as our modeling and then like us being able to just like start generating our open API descriptions and using that on our tooling. Like it's been a journey. It's been a journey. Even yeah, I think I think you are my new best friend. Your pain is my pain. You know, Salesforce is north of 20 years old. Our API space is so vibrant and different and in some ways aging that um, to me, it's it's about the humans, you know, architects have opinions, <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> principal members of technical staff have opinions. You know, every company ships their org chart to some degree. And I think the fundamental part of treating an API like a product is customer first and this customer demands consistency and when you give it to them it's really as you said a lot of effort internally in the organization to deliver great docs absolute consistency uh, but when you do that you see massive adoption and you see roi and you know at salesforce we measure roi with the growth of our customers' businesses mm -hmm. and growth of adoption and usage of our platform. And I just, I wish I had the magic pitch to, uh, to engineers to say, look, this extra 20% is worth it in the usage of your technology, especially because these APIs are long lived. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Absolutely. You're, you're right there. It's like, and it's like the common goal versus the individual goal, right? Like, because any single that, that's individual the thing. could just develop their API, put it out there and like not care about what all the other teams are doing. But that additional effort to take to standardize, to like drive that coherence, to like the, that, that additional effort is so appreciated by our developer, by our customers, right? Like, and it yields tremendous gain when it comes to efficiency for developers that are not having to like do brain surgery every time that they want. And it's to profitable, it. like excellent engineering upfront can be profitable for your company. I mean, I think we've seen that with several kinds of APIs that if you just get it right and if it takes two minutes for a developer to move from grabbing the schema to calling the API, then they're gonna to wanna to use it. They have a positive view of the company. They can write reusable code and that eventually translates into profit for the company, so. I really like what was, uh, what Yina was saying, you know, it's like the really, sometimes it's almost like a conflict between the interest of the, the individual API team and the interest of the, what we call API landscape or what could be, I think you call it um, group grouping, right? Like these, the kind of the bigger picture is like, what is, who are we actually designing for, which are the consumers, right? In the end, that's really what, why we're doing APIs. Um, and I think if you really have a very clear focus on improving the consumer experience, right? Then you logically end up in, in a place where you say, we cannot optimize one by one, we have to optimize for the whole set and then it, it becomes most effective. So, I mean, I'm just wondering your experience because it seems that both Yena and, and Gail, right, you've both gone through that experience or you're going through it. Um, what do you think are the most powerful ways how you can actually make that happen? Because I think that that kind of fundamental conflict of interest almost, right, between the individual team and the interests of the overall organization, that you will find that in many places. So I'm really curious if you have any 
um, really good experiences how you how you made that happen. I think a lot of people would appreciate that. Well, my work bag is full of carrots and sticks and wine and chocolate, and I pull them out depending on who I'm talking to. <laughs> I mean, it's. Um, I feel like sometimes my role is technical sales and sometimes my role is chief influencer for APIs. And, you know, I'm not above solving someone else's engineering problems so they get more resources to spend making their API better. I mean, I think there's not a, you know, appealing to goodwill, which is really what this is, is, uh, you know, I, I, ha I have found if I say, look, you can deliver what you have, and people might use it, or you could spend more time and make it really, really, really strong and easy for developers, then you will get 2x your goal, or you will get 3x your goal, whatever your goal is. And appealing to, you know, some company, every company, every you know, public company certainly is profit driven. And if you can say, look, doing this well, will cause you to go green on your executive board about who met their goals because you make it easy. Um, that's been, I think, a very useful way to get the point across. Um, that's your biggest I, carrot. <laughs> it yeah, is, I mean. Yeah, I, I think you bring up another thing, which I, I think is really important. And that is we've talked a lot about the technical specs and being able to coordinate or govern or manage or whatever. There's also the business specifications, right? There's just the very simple, the metrics of how we measure success. And at some point, as if we're really saying, you know, product specifications, API products, right? So that's engineering, it's sales, it's product management, it's all of those things. So establishing goals, establishing goalposts, whether you call them KPIs or OKRs or whatever they are, that almost needs to be part of the same story too. Sure, there's probably some specification to make it easier to get to the technical level. But you also, I think what I'm hearing from Gail is you also need to say, well, what are your numbers? What are your metrics? What are your goals? And I can, I can help you get there yeah. if you do this or, or you know, we yeah, can get there sooner. Yeah, doing it in the service of the, you know, I'm, I'm an engineer, I have a master's in CS, like I'm a gigantic nerd, but I understand that APIs and my work is in service of the business. And so the more you can align the, and the teams doing the work and the deliverable connect it directly to moving the business forward and moving our customers forward. I think that to me is the most successful strategy I've had. That's that's yeah. right on Gail. I think that I will say that getting started is really hard. Getting the ball rolling with the first set of teams that like, you know, kind of the first followers that are going to start like on that motion is it's really hard. In my case, it took us, um, doing quite frankly a lot of work for them and uh and like to get the ball rolling and to like start showing some of that momentum and get and then using customers customer feedback and like what were their experiences and like what were they were going from to and from right like what was their prior experience when they had to like navigate across 10,000 different set of api api sets not being able to le leverage their learning curves abandoning product and uh, projects and integration with our platform because it was just too damn difficult so and then going to the like oh my gosh i love this i love the fact that i can just like you know use api very easily so we use a lot of that customer feedback and to just like drive that because before you can get Mike to the common OKR, so the common goals, so the common objectives. You need to have the buy-off of the people. And the way that you do it is, you know, you align to the business and then you show there's this is really has customer impact. And, and obviously getting started with the first one is a little bit hard, but then once you get that momentum, uh, it's, you can have that evidence to show how it, um, how it impacts customers in a real way. Cool, very good. I think we lost Adam for a minute there, but I see your your back. I, do you actually see me now? I think it was. A, I, I can see. Yeah, actual, I can. I think you're actually now. You're not like this anymore. Yeah, now camera you're hardware. Is is better. Yeah, I think you have a better network now or whatever. Uh, uh, do you yes, have, like? I, do you have any opinion or experiences here. around that that we were? Yeah, we were I, I as I was as I was listening to that, I was really thinking about just if you bring. API specifications as as a requirement to to a group that it will look like a chore. And so I think sort of the thread that I heard uh, between what 
others were saying here is that you want to show how it actually will improve. I mean, there's a reason for it, right? And if you just see it as another way to document the technical bits, then that's going to miss that bigger picture that, uh, that can really make things more efficient and improve developer experience. Um, and, you know, you talked about consumers, there's the API consumers, but then uh, you go one more level to the actual people who are consuming, the actual users who are seeing the benefits of, uh, of a better API that is passing the data that they want to want to receive, right? So, um, so I think if you can tell that full story, um, and I, uh, I really appreciated the sort of do a little bit of work for them uh, aspect, because I think that, that that can show what really is possible. I really like that viewpoint of, you know, also looking not just at, I mean, because there's so much is being said about developer experience, which, which of course is important, right? But in the end, I think, uh, I mean, the developers are not, so to speak, the consumers of the actual product, right? They're the right. consumers of the API. And, and then like whatever they build then gets consumed by somebody. And, but I think at some point, I, I'm not sure, you know, how, I mean, that I think it's maybe then a little bit aligned with what Gail said when, when they're measuring success basically by measuring growth of their customers and this kind of stuff, right? Where in the end, that is not really something that is driven so much by developer, developer experience. I mean, indirectly in part, right? But right. it's more, yep. it's like also, do we have the right APIs for actually making that happen? So that's, that's the one thing that I really would like to discuss a little bit because we have, we have such, such a great selection of people here. So, I mean, I think still right now we have a lot of focus just on the interface aspect and that's fine because well, APIs are interfaces, right? But in the end, really all that matters is the value that we produce with or that we deliver through the APIs, let's put it like this. So I'm just wondering if there's any chance, if you have any view on also incorporating more a little bit of the product nature, so to speak, into the, the interface description. So a little while ago, what we did is we worked on these kind of API labels, you know, where you would be able to attach certain labels to APIs where you can make certain statements about what's in there. Is it, for example, is it relevant to privacy? Maybe where's the data stored and all the stuff that is not so much about the interface, but what actually happens behind the scene. So, so that was one attempt of trying to really not just talk about the interface, but what's actually happening behind the interface. And I'm wondering if, if anybody here has an opinion on, you know, is there any potential how we could work on something if we could come up with something that helps also exposing that in a little bit more, let's say standardized way. I'm really fishing for, you know, <laughs> standardization here because after all, this is the specifications conference and writing specifications is um, something I like to do. So I'm, I'm really always trying to find out, you know, is there something that seems to be cooking where people start thinking about stuff where it may be worth investing some effort and figuring out Maybe we could do something. Well, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just volunteer. I think one of the challenges that I see over and over again is whether or not you're manufacturing something or whether you're crafting something, right? So when you're manufacturing, I can have lots of standards about the exact size and measurement and materials and all these other things. And we produce thousands of them, right? And that's sort of the Intel idea, right? Is I want to drive out variability. I want all thousands and thousands of chips to be, you know, just the same with high quality. Of course, the crafting idea is that every, every one is, is takes some human crafting and creativity and art. It's not just, you know, spit out, uh, you know, by the thousands. It's actually, you're building one of them that a lot of people experience. I think most of the API experiences in the API shops that I work in, they're sort of on that experience side, right? They, they craft these things for an audience, for a particular group of people, and those people experience them. They don't produce, you know, mass produce them. And uh, standardizing this experience is super, super hard. Standardizing mass production is relatively easy. So I think there's a real sort of disconnect where I've seen people do a lot of standardization of the actual implementation details. They really drive quality pretty low. They become sort of a, 
sort of a, just a, a mill or something like that. So I'm really kind of skeptical of the notion of standardizing uh, some of the meta, but, but maybe there's some, some other level about this. Maybe it's not the implementation metadata that you're talking about. Maybe there's some other level. And, I, and actually, I, I really, I think Gail and Yina, these are people who are actually managing products. You probably have, you may have a very different view than my sort of conceptual view of it. I want to ask a clarifying question to Eric. Do you mean, are you looking for, like, if I want to attest that the data that my API returns is HIPAA compliant, or you, I want to attest that my service is PCI compliant, is that what you mean by looking for, you know, looking how to, how to describe what's behind the API? Pretty much, yeah. Some kind of, you know, you, you talked about these API groups, as you called them, right? So like these large, potentially large sets of APIs that people are working with. And I think it could be interesting to think about what are some of the quality attributes that I would like to attach basically to those individual APIs so that people can say, only show me those that, cert that, that have a certain quality to them because that's what I'm looking for, right? That could be rather technical stuff like, um, let's say availability information, right? What's, what's the SLA that I get? It could be a little bit more qualitative. I don't really know. I mean, I'm, I'm really fishing for stuff. That's here. pretty interesting. I mean, at, so at Salesforce, we publish the availability of all of our systems. You can find it at trust.salesforce.com and all of the acquisitions do that too. Um, and uh, we also have products specifically for industries that have pretty strict regulatory compliance, um, you know, PCI compliance for, um, or for retailers, HIPAA compliance, and, but I'm, I kind of want to take a rain check on my answer because I really want to think about how we might, I don't know if it's a description on the API or if it's some semantic in the response that, that attests and I just, I haven't, uh, I need to think more about it, but it's certainly interesting and it's certainly an area where if I'm an ISV, let's say for Salesforce and I produce a product and I want it to run on, you know, compliant and non-compliant uh, areas of Salesforce, I probably want to know that so I can change how I'm handling that data. So there's, it feels like there's something there, but there's a lot yeah. more to think through. But I mean, you know, it, it really, I, I like that, Train of thought. So, I mean, it could be both, right? It could be on the API or it could be uh, kind of on a more transactional level. So, so one thing, for example, that we see a lot happening in Europe now um, is that more and more companies are really becoming sensitive on where their data is actually being hosted, right? Because that makes a big difference in terms of what happens to the data. So that's something that you might want to have as as a description, right? Where you can say, well, I don't want, I, I won't even touch this API because that data it's gets stored in a in a uh, legislation where I don't want to have my data. Yeah, That's yeah I, I can take a little spin on that. So uh, on our products, we don't necessarily disassociate what the product is from a security and compliance perspective, what their offerings are from the API. But there, I think that there is an opportunity to express that information in the metadata. And we do use metadata extensively to express richness of the API when it comes to like, for example, what are the permissions that are necessarily to uh, call this particular API with drive DAOs as annotations in the metadata? What are the set of query parameters that the API supports? Because not everything, like quite frankly, our API looks like a Swiss cheese where not everything is supported everywhere. Um, so like, you know, describing that uh, allows us, I'm using the metadata for, th for that, allows us to provide better experiences. And we're looking into like, uh, you know, errors and rate limiting and all of these like more, not necessarily on the security and compliance space, but more on the like usage of the API, what information we can provide that then can feed into how we generate our SDKs and how we provide information to our developers when they're getting uh, through the, you um, when they're seeing the, the, the things happening in real time, how to react to that information. So like we do use that metadata extensively uh, to drive that. Like, and we're even now looking at how do we use that metadata as well for deprecation annotations, right? Like, and deriving, like knowing like what is deprecated, what is coming, when the change was implemented and all of that and trying to like include all of that information. Of course, that richness comes with trade-offs because like the more rich you are, the, the richer the metadata is, the more extensive it is. And uh, once you hit a certain skill, it starts, 
you know, having problems. The first time that we generated our open API descriptions, we had a hard time finding a tool all of all of the different tools that were out there that could process it and not break. So like, and adding more and more richness to that metadata brings more complexity and into like, what, how do you interop with, you know, the different tools and, and this, the manage that skill. But, um, but we use that extensively. And I think that there is an opportunity to like use more and more of API descriptions to provide that information and, and uh, make it make the experience richer. And so, so you kind of, oh, you kind sorry. of see, I'm sorry, you sort of see uh, descriptions as like runtime value, not just design time or? I think you can do, it can happen both, right? And both ends where, you know, it's both for description and then feeding all of the tooling that you have uh, as a byproduct of the having a rich description, but also at runtime, right? Like, you know, this and the, the example that I gave around deprecation annotations, right? Like that's something yeah. that at runtime, you know, you, developers can react to that on their code if that is there in the metadata. Cool, Adam. I'm sorry, I interrupted you. Yeah, I was going to yeah. say this sounds okay, Adam, like you go. It sounds like an API directory, and and again, maybe that's the programmable web background, but uh, the idea of being able to slice and dice what's available by particular um, particular attributes of the API that may not be at that technical endpoint or data level, um, you know, is a lot of what, uh, I mean, I, I can say back when I was at Programmable Web, I would have loved to have something that would allow me to programmatically be able to discover new APIs based on particular pieces of data. Um, and that was certainly, that was, we were trying to create that, I think. Uh, um, and uh, it does make me think of APIs.json, um, the, yeah, right. <laughs> the project yep. that's, that Ken Lane and 3Scale had worked on. This is back a few years ago as mm -hmm. trying to provide some of that, that metadata about it's APIs. Definitely, it's definitely yeah. going in that direction, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah and, the, and the Web of Things is doing this too, right? The thing that they, the, what they call the thing description has a lot of the same kind of metadata as well. And they're working on a discovery too. Yeah, that, that, that's a, kind of a specific space, but yeah, you're yeah. right. It's the same kind of approach. So I've, I've been alerted by Daryl. Um, so uh, we're kind of running out of time and there seems to be a lot of activity in the online chat. So Daryl wants to have a little bit of time for going to the Q and A. He also said that uh, he got some feedback that we should turn this into a weekly podcast. So I think I'll, I'll see everybody next week. Next week. Yeah. <laughs> Not sure that's happening on that, that frequency, but we'll see. There's certainly lots of things to discuss. So um, I would like to, to really thank everybody from my heart. It's really, it has been super nice. It, uh, it, it, the time really went by much faster than I, I only realize now how much time we already spent. So, Thank you so much for being on that panel, Gail, yeah. Ina, and Mike and Adam. So it, it was really fun for me. It was great that you were able to join. And um, I think I really would like to hand over the, um, the floor back to Daryl so that Daryl can go through a little bit of the questions that we got and we can get a little bit of interaction going on. So thanks everybody again. And thanks. Thank you, Eric. Yep. Yeah. So, so there certainly has been a fiery conversation going on in the chat with all sorts of related conversations. But there was one particular theme that I thought was really interesting to get more feedback uh, from you folks. And it, it started with uh, Jay Dreyer saying, the biggest thing I run into and do my best to stop is, this is just a one-off prototype, whatever, so I don't need to follow standards. And Kate Reher also said, oh, yeah, fighting the, oh, this is just an internal project. And this is the, we're the only one using it. And Ben Gamble said, internal projects should get as much management as external ones. This is all, all nearly always like a 10 to 1 ratio of internal to external. So we've talked a lot about standardizations and consistency and the value it brings. How do people find this issue of this is internal versus external and how do they overcome that particular set of problems? Well, you know. Gail waving her hand. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Uh, uh, yeah. 
Yeah, the, it's it's hard. It's hard. It's it's uh, the trade-offs between you know, oh, I'm just doing this internal API. Nobody else is gonna call it by my client, and then we should just like bypass every single guidance and and make it fast because we need it yesterday. Uh, you know, and the, the it come it will come back and bite uh, for sure. And uh, there's two parts to it. One, we need to make sure that we're making investments to make it as fast as possible. Because like we can't like debate forever on like what a nice API will be. There's also a time to market. So like you know, on our team, uh, we're investing on tooling that will help expedite API reviews. That will help uh, you know bring more uh, automation into the process of things that we already know, rules that we already know that are th things that can be taken care of without having that manual intervention, and uh, will expedite the process. But um, despite that, I think that it will continue to be attention on like how much do you put uh, and how much do you force it as well? Like what's the gate or what's the what's the motivation that back to what Gail was saying? What's the carrot and what's the stick? So, um, yeah, it's it's an interesting one for sure. So um, I have only ever seen these one off. Honestly, Gail, I'm only giving this API to one partner and it might be on the Internet, but it's not public. Like that'll never, that, that's, that never holds true over time. And that is always a security issue at some point. And I can, I will not share example after example after example <laughs> that I've seen of that. So in, um, there are times when it's less true at Salesforce because I think Salesforce has this rigor given their history and this commitment and that they've, I've only been there three months. And one of the things I've learned is every API version works all the time. And in my org, there's a process that runs for two weeks called the hammer that tests every piece of customer code ever to have been created before every Salesforce release, which is magical and difficult. Um, but the reason why we do it is because we do not want these one-off private things to come about and they get forgotten. And I have in my career seen many examples of, honestly, I just have to get this out fast. It doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be consistent. And the next thing you know, you have exposed data um, on the public internet or you have some other business confidential information. So sounds like a good idea, never do it. <laughs> One of the, I've, I've heard so That's many very clear variations on this, on this story before. Uh, one company that I, I talked to said that they, they actually created a sort of an audit system, their internal audit, they had an audit team and um, uh, leaderships, management's uh, team leaders' bonuses were based on how they passed the audit. So you can go ahead and make a decision to not follow all the steps, but you'll pay for it in the audit. Was one of the ways that one is the one of the sticks that they used. I've I've got I, I know some there are some other companies. Uh, there are some products that actually monitor runtime to see if you're matching the specification. I know more than one customer where they submit a very nice open API document and they never code to that. They get it passed, they get it in the catalog, then they go write their code however they want to write their code. So there's another sort of governance challenge, which is uh, after you pass the gate, you have to actually stay consistent. So there's this whole system of pen testing and, and validation testing too. There's a lot in this area. Uh, and I think uh, Ina's comment was really good. A lot of times people say, well, I just need this once because it turns out it's so costly or it's so, it's so time consuming to actually yeah. do it the way you're being instructed. So a lot of times that means you need to change the, the way the process works. Uh, automate more, um, have certain kinds of you know, gates along the way that might make it a little bit easier. The, the reason people wanna yeah. skip this isn't because they wanna do something bad, it's because they wanna get something done. On, on the internal versus external question, I have never understood why someone would want to give a poor developer experience to all of their internal engineers. <laughs> I like from a, from just a, a human time standpoint, I have not understood that. And so if it's a one-off, I could see feeling like that's not the case, but like others have said, I think that's, that's rarely so. And teams expect to grow and someone's going to come in and have to figure out 
what this does and how to use it. Yeah, it's, it's, only, it's only my family that are walking over this bridge. We don't have to be very careful about constructing it. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I also, I mean, I definitely would like to uh, just say, you know, how much I agree with Yina and Mike here is that in the end, the thing is like, if you make this effective, so if you make it for easy for teams to actually play by the rules, right? If you give them the right tooling, if you, if you make them as productive as you can possibly make them, then the incentive of saying, I, 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 I'm ignoring the rules because I need to do something fast, right? That incentive is going down a whole lot. And I think that really is one of the magic things that you can do there is to really always focus on like, what's, what's the biggest pain point for our API development teams right now? What's taking them the most time that is not solving the business problem, but solving an API problem. How can we make that smaller? Right. And if you, I think if you always iterate on that, I think that actually can, can be pretty magical in particular, if you have a lot of teams, right, because you get a lot of input and that is a very, very great um, data source for you to work on. And there's, I want to maybe one more little nuance on this point is there's a difference between an experimental API and an experimental capability. And so, for example, if Salesforce wants to expose a new capability for customers to try, we could do that via API and we uh, and be very clear around support expectations and uptime expectations. And there's definitely a vehicle to rigorously you know, provide access to new stuff that's not yet beta, not yet GA versus the one-off, I need to hand data to a partner. So I'm just gonna code a crappy API to go do that, that has insufficient security. And so uh, I think the, the former is really important, right? I have a new capability, I want feedback, I wanna, I wanna roll it out, but you still need to roll it out in a way that um, meets your developer's expectations. That's good, yeah, yeah. Daryl, do you have one more? I, I no, and but but I, I think uh, <laughs> this has been a really awesome conversation, and I think the one thing that I have learned from watching the chat stream by is that there is a significant appetite for hearing more of these kind of conversations. Uh, we, should, we should figure out how to make it happen. There's definitely, uh, the, the API industry is taking off on almost like a second phase, I think at the moment. And uh, I think we need to share this knowledge on more than just API specifications, but also on you know, the business of APIs. So uh, we'll definitely be investigating if there's the ways that we could maybe make this happen on a more regular basis and get more of the knowledge and experience of all these bright industry professionals and uh, get us down a more healthy path. Cool. So I want to say thank you very much for all of you for uh, taking the time out of your day to come join. Mm -hmm. It's been excellent. And we have a break coming up and then we have a whole host of additional sessions for the rest of the afternoon. So enjoy. And if there's anything that you can't see because uh, you're in a different session, don't worry. They will be available on YouTube after the fact. Cool. Thank Thanks you. Again, Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank